in the subway tunnels beneath New York City. Holiday shoppers packed the trains on Saturday afternoon, December 22, 1984. At 1.45 p.m., a number two train glided forward, heading south toward Wall Street. Five gunshots rang out. Riders screamed and dove for cover. A thin white man stood over the writhing bodies of four black teenagers he had just shot. The 38 caliber pistol was still in his hand. The conductor halted the train and rushed back to the scene. He asked the gunman, are you a cop? No, the man answered. They tried to rip me off. Together with the conductor, the shooter reached down to help two frightened women who were lying on the floor. The conductor then asked for the gun. Without responding, the man went out a door at the end of the car and leapt into the dark tunnel. Police arriving on the scene sealed off the tunnel but could not find the gunman. In the meantime, emergency medical units tended to the four gunshot victims. All were alive but seriously injured with gunshots in the upper body. The most damaging bullet, the final one fired, had severed the spine of 19-year-old Daryl Cabey, who was paralyzed from the waist down. Witnesses at the scene said one victim, Troy Canty, stated, he shot me for nothing. I didn't do anything. I just asked him for five dollars. The shooting was front page news in New York and around the country. Sketches of the shooter were posted throughout the subway system as the police launched a massive manhunt for him. Mayor Ed Koch increased police patrols on the city's subway system and denounced vigilante justice. No one can with impunity take the law into their own hands and give instant justice. We will not permit it. But on the streets, most New Yorkers cheered the gunman. <laughs> what do you think of the vigilante? Great. Wonderful. I have no pity on criminals. You know, if they're going to rip off people, they get what they deserve. And most who didn't support the gunman at least understood. I've been mugged. I've been almost raped, but I still don't think he did the right thing. I still, I hope, I hope they catch him and I hope they punish him. In fact, crime was rampant on New York subways. Nearly 12,000 felony crimes had been reported in the subway system during the first 10 months of 1984, about 40 per day. On the trains in the week following the shootings, people spoke of a sense of relief of having won a round against the criminals. It's about time people started taking action against these uh, young kids that are murdering people and robbing people on a train. In fact, crime in the subways dropped substantially in the week immediately following the shooting. A police hotline set up to gather information about the shooting was flooded with calls supporting the gunman's actions. Some callers volunteered to help pay his defense. Others suggested he run for mayor. But the day after Christmas, an anonymous caller said that a man named Bernard Getz fit the description of the shooter. He was tall, slender, and blonde, and owned a gun. The caller said Getz had also been mugged three years earlier. The police followed up on the lead but could not locate Getz to question him. On New Year's Eve, eight days after the shooting, Getz made it easy for them, turning himself into police in Concord, New Hampshire. The 37-year-old Getz was a walking media event by the time he was returned to Manhattan four days later. He acknowledged the shootings with startling frankness, asserting that he, not the four teens, was the victim. Meanwhile, the four wounded young men were all still hospitalized. Paralyzed Daryl Cabey remained in serious condition, but the others had shown signs of recovery. As police investigated, it emerged that all four had prior criminal records with past charges ranging from petty theft to armed robbery. The four gave police conflicting statements about what had happened on the train, but all of them said the shooter had been unprovoked. Bernard Getz was charged with four counts of attempted murder, assault, and carrying an illegal handgun. The charges were based largely on a videotaped confession taken while he was with the New Hampshire police. In the confession, Getz says he exploded in fear and anger when he realized he was about to be beaten and robbed. I wanted to kill those guys, I wanted to maim those guys, I wanted to make them suffer in every way I could. It was attempted cold blooded murder, I don't deny that, and if you're gonna pass judgment on that, good. If I had more bullets, I would have shot them all again and again. The old, my problem was I ran out of bullets, and I was gonna I was gonna gouge one of the guy's eyes out with my keys afterwards. Getz described how he entered the car and sat down by himself. 
There were four rowdy black teenagers at one end of the car. Soon one of the teenagers, Troy Kenty, walked up to Getz and asked, how you doing? Fine, Getz replied. Kenty asked for a match, then the time gets recalled. Getz said he was surrounded by all four teenagers when Kenty demanded $5. He his exact words were, give me $5. He said it with a smile, and his eyes were bright. When I saw the, the smile on his face and the, shine, and the shine in his eyes that he was enjoying this, I knew what they were going to do. Sensing he was about to be beaten or maimed, Getz pulled out his 38 and shot them all. I became a vicious animal, and if you think that is so terrible, I just wish anyone could have been there in my place. So anyone who's going to pass judgment, fine. I was vicious. My intent was to kill him. And, and, and you just decide what's right and wrong. A vigilante is exactly what the prosecution wanted to label Bernie Getz, invoking the stereotype of an angry man enforcing his own moral code with a gun. The defense would argue that Getz was not enforcing any law, but merely protecting himself from four violent criminals. The subway shooting was an emotional release for many people. If fighting back made Bernie Getz a vigilante, then to much of the American public, vigilantes were good. In the eyes of the law, however, his actions walked to the edge of justifiable behavior. Americans are able to use deadly force to defend life and property with fewer restrictions than anywhere else in the world. If the police can't protect you, you can do it yourself. It's a concept of self-defense deeply rooted in American justice. When Bernard Getz opened fire on four black teenagers in a New York subway car, it was in part because he didn't think the police could keep him safe. Getz had been mugged once before near this subway station in 1981. Getz, an electrical engineer, had been robbed of some expensive equipment and severely beaten. His left knee sustained permanent damage from the attack. His lawyer, Barry Slotnick, feels that based on the gunman's experience, he had good reason to feel vulnerable. He was badly beaten. Property was taken and destroyed from him. He wasn't going to let that happen again to him. And he certainly didn't. To prevent it, Getz tried to obtain a license to carry a gun. New York City has strict gun control laws, and the application was denied. Having exhausted all legal means, he began to go beyond the law, buying and carrying a gun anyway. And in trying to justify the 1984 subway shooting, his defense was based on the idea that he shot out of fear for his life. There were those, however, who thought the motive was not only fear, but anger. I think it also came from a racist point of view, that he hated them because of the color of their skin. In 1996, attorney William Kunstler won a $43 million civil lawsuit against Getz on behalf of Daryl Kaby. Kunstler felt that if a black man had gunned down four white teens, the public reaction might have been less favorable. But the juxtaposition of the races, four blacks, one white man, makes the public, the white public certainly, the dominant public in this case, makes them even more vindictive more inclined toward a vigilante, more inclined to a sort of a, a lynch justice. But Roy Innes, who heads the Congress of Racial Equality, feels race made no difference. The majority of people, including the majority of blacks, responded the way I did, which is to support the citizen who stood up and said no to being a victim. For much of New York, Getz remained the city's favorite crime stopper even as the Manhattan District Attorney's Office took four counts of attempted murder to a grand jury. The grand jury is often considered a rubber stamp for the prosecutor's office, but in a startling decision on January 25th, the grand jury refused to indict Getz on the attempted murder charges, citing him only on the illegal handgun count. The District Attorney's Office was very upset about that. There was tremendous pressure uh, by some who were politically correct uh, to see to it that he was indicted. So they went to another grand jury. Three months later, the second grand jury did indict Getz on all the charges, a decision which was appealed by Slotnick. Appeals and counter-appeals would drag on for two and a half years until the trial finally opened on April 27, 1987. 
In his opening statements that day, Barry Slotnick told jurors that this case would provide a unique legal experience. Everything you see in this courtroom, he said, will be contrary to what you know of the laws of American justice. Everything's turned upside down. He told the jurors that in the course of defending Bernie Getz, he would in effect be prosecuting the four shooting victims on robbery charges. Slutnik argued that Getz was not a vigilante as the press had labeled him, but a reasonable man acting in self-defense. Continuing the role reversal theme, prosecutor Greg Waples told jurors they could ignore the testimony of the four shooting victims, but they could not forget the words of Bernard Getz himself. The videotape confession, Waples argued, would allow jurors to get a glimpse inside the gunman's head. I know, and if there's a God, God knows what was in my heart, and it was, it was, it was, it was sadistic and savage. It was, that's, that was my, that was me. The prosecutor said Getz was paranoid of becoming a victim. The gunman, he said, confessed to the attempted murder of four black teenagers because of a request for $5 a scenario which amounted to panhandling at most, not robbery. The videotape was the prosecution's most damning evidence. Waples showed the jury the entire two-hour tape. Most damaging was Getz's statement that he fired his last bullet, not in heated self-defense, but with cold-blooded intent. I went back to the other two to check on them. And the fellow who was standing up, I was sure I had shot him. And I said, you seem to be doing all right. Here's another. That was the bullet that struck and paralyzed 19-year-old Daryl Cavey. He was in no danger then. It was just blood urge gripping this man, and he was going to kill these blacks. Didn't matter what they were doing. Cavey sustained minor brain damage as a result of the shooting and was unable to testify. But two of the remaining three shooting victims did take the stand to tell their versions of the events of December 22nd. A well-dressed Troy Canty appeared anything but a hoodlum when he walked into court. He was the person that approached Getz and asked him for $5. Canty offered a substantially different version of the events than Getz had described in his taped confession. He stated that Getz was not surrounded by all four teens, but that he, Canty, had approached Getz alone. Canty said the four were not going to rob Getz, just have some fun with him. Shooting victim James Ramsour told basically the same story as Canty, but presented the court with a very negative picture of the four young men Getz was facing. At the time of the trial, Ramsour was in jail for attempted rape. He showed great disdain for the court and became petulant under heated questioning from Slotnick. By the end of the two days of questioning, he simply refused to answer. Judge Stephen Crane charged him with five counts of contempt of court. It was another example of the traditional roles in the courtroom being upside down. The defense had actually gained great influence with the jury by the testimony of a victim. Slotnick could now paint the teens as hoodlums that any reasonable man would be intimidated by. Remsewer's appearances gave the jury a perfect image of a thug. In a further twist, Slotnick found positive material on the tape confession. He was able to show Getz as a fearful victim reacting on gut self-preservation instinct. What they were going to do is enjoy me for a while. They were going to beat the f out of me. The situation when the two move on my left and the two are on my right, now that is a real threat. It's become a basic tenant of American justice that when threatened, one has the right to use as much force as necessary to repel the threat. But William Kunstler felt that Getz went too far in defending himself. He could have run, he could have screamed, he could have put his fists up, but to go to the ultimate, trying to kill someone, I don't think there was enough there. When you believe you're about to be assaulted or robbed, and you reasonably believe that you're going to be injured or your property is about to be taken, and you feel, find the need to protect yourself, at that point you have a right to inflict deadly physical force upon your assailant. Slotnick was making an indirect reference to one of the landmark decisions in the issue of self-defense, Brown versus United States. But even with the Brown president, Slotnick was still faced with a daunting challenge. He had to ask jurors not to believe the words of his own client. One of the fellows, it looked like he was trying to get to the steel wall of the subway car, but he couldn't. And I let him have it. And I let one of the other guys have it. I went back to the other two to check on them. And the fellow who was standing up, I was sure I had shot him. And I looked at him and I said, 
You seem to be doing all right. Here's another. Bernie Getz said that on his videotape confession. Couldn't have happened. Slotnick argued that once Getz started shooting, a fight or flight adrenaline surge occurred within him. That adrenal surge can cause what is known as a false recollection. The memory of the shooter is clear until the moment the trigger is pulled. It's a phenomenon that's been documented by the FBI and others put in similar situations. Slotnick had to convince the jurors that the most damning part of the confession was false, even though Getz himself believed it to be true. He never shot anybody in the back. He never walked up and shot, shot somebody in the chest as they were disabled. He believes to this day that that's what happened. It never happened. And as we went through the trial, we put on our experts to show angle of entry, to show flight line of bullets, and the jury saw that Bernie Getz's confession was pure fantasy. What matters most for jurors in cases like these is often who they see as the victim. In his closing statement, Slotnick pointed to what he called the gang of four. It's these four, he said, who have distorted and destroyed his life. I ask you to put an end to that suffering. The simple truth, argued Slotnick, was that Getz was reacting to a quickly unfolding situation and it left no time for negotiation. Waples tried to paint the four teens as victims, but he knew that his hopes of convicting Getz lay with the videotape and he pleaded with the jury not to ignore it. Waples told the jury that no matter how much they might sympathize with Getz, they could not simply ignore the statement, you look all right, here's another. After seven weeks of trial, the jury retired to deliberate with 10,000 pages of court records. They did not come back for 30 hours. For me, it was endless. It was forever. It's a lifetime. Uh, it was a long deliberation process. To a hushed courtroom, the jury acquitted Getz on the most serious charges of attempted murder. He was found guilty of carrying an illegal handgun. He was sentenced and served six months in prison for that crime. Thank you.